The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he passed by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then they abandoned their nets and followed him. He walked a little, along a little farther and saw James and the son, of, the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They too were in the boat mending their nets. Then he called them, so they left their father Zebedee in the boat along with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. And our Holy Father Francis has invited us to mark this third Sunday in ordinary time as a Sunday dedicated to the Word of God. The Second Vatican Council issued many dogmatic constitutions. One of the, the dogmatic constitutions was called De Verbum, which is the Word of God. How do Catholics understand the Word of God? Well, it's this way, really. It has two aspects. It's twofold. One is the sacred scriptures. St. Jerome, he lived in the 400s. He said, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. And then St. Thomas Aquinas, some 500 years later or so, maybe six, 700 years later, 1100s, he said, the scriptures are the soul of our sacred theology. And you may have heard me share that story earlier in my own life. When I was a student in engineering, I had a good friend, a Baptist, and he said to me, well, you know, you Catholics don't believe in the Bible. And it was kind of news to me. He said, that's kind of odd. I'm a Catholic. I thought they would have taught me that I didn't believe in the Bible if, I was, uh, if that's really what we believe. But the sad truth of that statement is I never read the Bible much. Now, my good friend, I really owe him a great deal, I think, because that was part of my story of becoming a priest, actually, because I started to read the scriptures. I started to read them, and I was not surprised. I had heard it before. I knew the scriptures, basically. I just didn't realize it. And the reason for that is I was fortunate to be in home where we went to Mass every Sunday. And if you go to Mass every Sunday for three years, you get through like 40% of the Bible. Father Mike Schmidt, he started this year a podcast where he's reading through the scriptures, reading through the Bible. And in one year, if you listen to his podcast, 20 minutes a day, you'll read through the entire scriptures. Um, and, and it's really beautiful. I've listened to a few of them, and it's really wonderful. As Catholics, we really need to immerse ourselves in the Word of God. And so we have the sacred scriptures as one dimension of that Word of God, but also we have the sacred tradition. And that is the apostolic tradition that's been passed on to us through the ages. In fact, St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16, I believe it is, maybe 15, he says, brothers and sisters, take the words that I enjoin on you today, not only the written word, but the, tra the tradition as well. And so what we as Catholics have is we have this beautiful understanding of God's word as it was revealed to us in the sacred scriptures. And St. Paul says, all scripture is good for teaching and reproving and helping people understand things. And you know, I, I'm pretty confident that Paul was not thinking, oh, and by the way, the, re the things I've written down in these letters, they're scripture. He's not talking about, I don't think he would be talking about that. He wouldn't be so presumptuous to think that, oh, this is sacred scripture. But it would be the Old Testament. And I tell you, as you read the Old Testament, and you see the prophecies, prophecies of Jesus laid out and fulfilled, it's amazing. It's utterly astounding. In that first reading, we hear Jonah going and preaching at Nineveh. And he was going to it was going to take three days to cross over the city, but he only preached for one day, <coughs> and the whole city was converted. 
And you know, he's a little miffed about that because he kind of wanted God to get him. He wanted to sit back there and say, you know, 40 days later, you're going to be destroyed. And boy, can't, I can't wait. God hears their voices. They repent. They put on sackcloth and ashes. And he doesn't do the destruction. And Jonah's kind of miffed about the whole thing. God doesn't love destruction. He wants repentance at the deepest core of our being. And you know what's beautiful? You're probably familiar with the story, Jonah, right? He spent three days in the belly of the whale, as it's commonly talked about. But Brent Petrie, in that book we gave out a couple years ago, The Case for Jesus, he talks about this. And this is really a beautiful thing. It doesn't say that Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale. It says Jonah spent three days in Sheol. In other words, it seems to suggest that as Jonah was swallowed by the whale, he died. And three days later, he came to preach. And recall, Jesus said, I'm not going to give you any sign but the sign of Jonah. So if you knew the Hebrew and you understand that story of Jonah, it wasn't so much that Jonah spent three days in the belly of a fish, but he died and three days later he was risen from the dead. He was raised up to go preach to the people of Nineveh. My friends, we need to know our faith well enough to preach to our neighbors. But not with kind of arrogance or self-righteousness, but with great love and compassion to help the people understand what is true, good, and beautiful. It's not very effective to, to go to someone and say, you're wrong, why do you believe something that stupid? That may be the case, but I'm telling you, you're not going to win over many people if you talk like that. But just maybe if you talk to them and say, well, why do you think it's a good idea to let someone kill an unborn child? Why do you think that should happen? And then you might be able to try and see their rationale. They might say, well, it's not a human being. Well, what do you do? then what's a human being? And what I'm trying to get at is science is on our side, guys. God's truths are there for human thriving. How many parents wish that their, ch their children listened to them? Can you imagine how much suffering and pain children would have spared themselves had they only listened to their parents? But boy, is that hard. It's easy to be rebellious. We need to try and understand that parents have great insight. And we will save and protect ourselves from great harm if we listen to our parents. And I think it's safe to say that parents aren't perfect. Parents don't always maybe make the right decisions or know everything. But they know a lot more than their children. But God, he does know everything. He knows exactly what's good for us. And if we allow ourselves to be formed by God's teachings and his commands, like the psalmist says, Oh Lord, teach me your commands. Do we long for that insight? Do we long for that wisdom? Because my friends, I'm telling you, if we put that wisdom into practice in our own lives, our life will be spared much suffering and pain. It really does set us up for joy and success. The scriptures unlock this. I can remember reading the book of Wisdom, chapter 2. And I was utterly taken aback by it. It was written a hundred years before Jesus Christ was born. And it's a perfect prophecy of Jesus. It goes something like, let us beset the just one, even to see him, he's obnoxious to us. He styles himself against our doings, charges us with transgressions of the law, calls God his father. Even to see him is a hardship for us. But let us, let him, let us put him to the test. Let us try his gentleness. Let us condemn him to a shameful death. For if God is his father, God will take care of him. But these were their thoughts and they erred because their wickedness blinded them. They knew not the hidden counsels of God. It was amazing. It says, let us condemn him to a shameful death. With revilement and torture, let us put him to the test. Wisdom, chapter 2, if you have a good translation. It's one of the deuterocanonical books. It's one of the books that the Protestants have left out of the Bible. 
It's often in their Apocrypha. But my friends, the Scriptures unleash and unreveal so much about our faith. Our world needs this. There's been great apostasy. Apostasy isn't, you know, non-Catholics or non-Christians. That's not apostasy. Apostasy is when you're a Christian, more specifically a Catholic, and you deny aspects of the Catholic faith. If you don't respect life from an innocent unborn child, you're an apostate. You're not, that's not being a good Catholic. Because Catholics respect life from the first moment of conception until natural death. Now, people can have good intentions. I'm not judging their soul. I can't say they're going to hell. That's not my job. That's above my pay grade. But I can certainly say they're wrong and they're an apostate. And it's up to God to take care of the rest. But here we're afraid, it seems like, to even reveal and reflect and and let people know what the truth is. The only reason why something is sinful is because it harms us. It hurts us. And as Christians, why should we care, right? If we live a good holy life and we're trying to let not sin, what do we care if someone else sins? It's none of my business, right? Well, why do we care? Because we don't want them to go to hell. We want them to know the joy of Christ. We want them to live a life of human thriving. You know, that analogy I often, I, I've often used, you'll probably, I repeat things, you know, and so sorry about that. Some of these images seem to, to work pretty well, but it's like you see somebody plant a bomb on a bridge and it takes 10 minutes to cross the bridge. And you see one of your friends starting to cross the bridge and he said, don't go, don't cross the bridge. It's got a bomb, it's going to go off in five minutes. And they say, yeah, right, I don't believe you. I said, I saw it, I know, this is true, <laughs> just don't go. And you even start walking across the bridge with him and trying to dissuade him from crossing the bridge. But about two and a half minutes into the trip, you stop. Start walking the other way and start shouting and say, hey, stop, don't do this. And if they fail to heed your warnings, sadly, they will be blown up. It's our love that tries to help the world understand what is true, good, and beautiful. Trying to save people from pain and heartache and suffering. And what does that usually get us? Ridicule, mockery, the cancel culture is very prevalent, seemingly more more prevalent now, and maybe in the future much more prevalent. But take heart. God loves you. I love you. Let us pray that we can love each other and reveal that love to those around us. Let us be like Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, who dropped their nets to follow the Lord. And you know, Jews had an obligation to honor their father and mother. The only thing that would would give them the permission to drop their nets is I think because in their heart they understood that it was God that was inviting them. The only person that takes precedent over our own parents would be God himself. And they understood this. And they followed the Lord. Let us follow the Lord. He is infinitely patient with us. Don't be discouraged because of our own sinfulness. But strive for holiness. Strive to tear out any hatred in your heart. The thing that our society, the the divisiveness and the battles that we face in our society are principally not political factions. It's diabolical. And how can you tell? What marks diabolical activity? Division, hatred, anger, impatience. Pretty clear, isn't it? Tear those things out of our lives. Let us pray that the Lord will help us tear those things out of our lives to grow in our love, to grow in our compassion, and be a leader in society, to be a peacemaker, and to point out others' apostasy, but in a charitable way, in a loving way. Hopefully that they repent and not lose their soul. That's why the church teaches what it does. Because of its love, not because it's on some kind of power trip. It has nothing to do with that. 
My friends, let us pray that God will help us do just that, okay? I hope I don't get in trouble here, but we have a little anniversary blessing. 45 years. John, Althea, Althea didn't know this was coming. I hope you still help me. <laughs> John, Althea, on the anniversary of that celebration, I wish you join your lives in an ungrateful bond to the sacrament of matrimony. You now intend to renew before the Lord the promises you made to one another. Turn to the Lord in prayer, that these vows may be strengthened by your life. To remain faithful in our love for one another so that we may be true witnesses to the covenant you have made with humankind. May the Lord keep you, you safe all the days of your life. May he be your comfort in adversity and your support in prosperity. May he fill your home with his blessings through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the Lord increase and sanctify, Lord, increase and sanctify, Lord, the love of your servants, Althea and John, who once gave each other rings as a sign of faithfulness, that they may now always grow in the grace of the sacrament through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Great, right, guys. And at the end of Mass, we'll have another little blessing there at the end. Let us stand and profess our faith in the only God who can save. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now we bring our prayers of intercession before the Lord. For the church, that she may continue to manifest and reveal the saving powers of Christ to our world, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. <clears throat> for all nations of the world, that all work for lasting peace and mutual respect for human dignity and not be motivated by greed and self-interest, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that we may all be open to God's word and strive to deepenly study and understand its implications for our lives. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Lou Martinez, the intention of this Mass, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all our personal intentions found in our parish book and that our parish may prepare disciples to love the true, the good, and the beautiful. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. 
that all corruption be uncovered and those responsible for it lose their power and are replaced by leaders who respect life, religious liberty, and all that is in accord with the natural law. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For more vocations to the priesthood, religious life, faith-filled marriages, and the dedicated single life, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who have died, that they may come to know the fullness of God's joy in heaven, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to the pandemic, and for all those who strive to keep us healthy and secure, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Holy Father, who are called faithful, requiring and rewarding the observance of your covenant, be pleased to fill with your blessings these your servants, Althea and John, who celebrate their 45th anniversary of marriage. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, hear the prayers of the people gathered here before you, those spoken and those kept in the silence of our hearts. Answer them insofar as they meet our deepest needs and are in accord with your holy and divine will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Did you guys get married when you were like 10 years old or something? 